Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to the John DeVito Show. Today, I wanted to talk about the topic that we hear so much about in the news today, climate change. Now, thinking about climate change, I'm 55 years old, and we hear a lot about this every day. Now, I'm not sure if you're all aware, but there is a lot of money that is tied to climate change. Now, if you're not familiar with the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement is an agreement where the world's wealthier countries reaffirm their commitment to mobilize at least $100 billion of climate funding annually. <clears throat> so if you think about that, $100 billion is glowing, going to battle, quote unquote, climate change annually every year and this is to help developing countries to adapt to climate change invest in renewable energy and achieve low carbon development so i know that climate change is a large topic to debate today and a lot of people believe the climate change narrative and a lot of people don't feel that it's completely accurate and they don't feel that men or it's a it's a man-made type of situation that has caused this because of the use of fossil fuels automobiles you know factories that burn coal and whatever else so a lot of people believe that climate change is completely man-made and others believe that it's a natural occurrence what side do you fall fall on now for me i am on the right i'm more of a republican than anything else and I don't even know if saying that I'm a Republican is accurate. I'm more of a constitutionalist that believes in following the Constitution to the letter of the law. But that being said, there's a huge divide in this country over whether or not climate change is, is man-made. Now, for me, being that I'm 55 years old, I have seen a lot of different changes over the years and a lot of different topics that have been introduced to the American public and to the world public. Now, I grew up going to elementary school in the 1970s. So when I think back upon the teachings in the 1970s, we didn't hear about global warming or climate change back in the 1970s. Back in the 1970s, I still remember being afraid when our teachers would talk about we were looking at the next ice age. The next ice age was coming. And they would say that it was way off in the distant future. But... I mean, when you're a young child, it's hard to understand that this ice age could happen well after the time that you exist on this planet. So for me, I remember hearing about uh, the next ice age, and it was terrifying. It was very scary to hear about this. And I remember thinking about it at night when I was going to bed and worrying about, you know, is there going to be an ice age? Is everyone going to die? And I remember the fear that this instilled in me at a very young age. Then, as I got a little bit older, you didn't hear as much about the next Ice Age. I mean, there, there were articles on the cover of Time magazine about the next Ice Age was eminent. So we weren't really talking about global warming, or as they now call it, climate change, because, you know, when it's global warming, you have to prove that the Earth is consistently warming. With climate change, it doesn't matter what happens. If there's a big hurricane, if there's a big rainy season, if there is... Um, you know, an Arctic vortex coming down and you have a very cold winter, if it's an extremely hot and dry summer, all of that can be attributed to climate change because the climate always changes. That is the history of our planet. The climate will always change. So it's impossible to prove that wrong because it isn't wrong, but you have to decide whether or not you feel it's man-made. So anyway, back in the 1970s, I remember hearing about the next ice age and it terrified me. Then we moved from the next ice age to acid rain. Now, who remembers acid rain? I'm sure there's some, there are some older people out there that remember acid rain. For the younger people out there, this was a thing that was talked about again in the late 1970s, 1980s. We were going to have literally acid rain because of the, um, the toxins that we were putting into the atmosphere. So again, here I am as a young person hearing about acid rain. And I couldn't imagine what it meant to have rain 
that was like acid falling through the sky. I mean, is it going to you know, melt the paint off of cars? If you were outside, is it going to harm you? When you research what it is now, it was just that the rain was going to be slightly acidic. So, but again, this was another scare tactic. You know, we heard about the next ice age. Then we heard about acid rain, which if you really think about it, is terrifying when you're young. So acid rain went away. I remember back then you could no longer use spray types of deodorant or hairspray because that was playing into the acid rain. And that transitioned right into the next scare tactic, which was the hole in the ozone layer. Now, who remembers this? Now, we had first, again, the next ice age. We had acid rain. And then we had the giant hole in the ozone layer. Now, many of the things you do today, again, are because of this giant hole in the ozone layer. The ultraviolet rays were coming in through the hole and people were going to burn. Skin cancer was going to be an epi epidemic. So back in the 70s and 80s, you would use, when you went to the beach or when you went outside, suntan lotion. You were looking to get a suntan. When we had the giant hole in the ozone layer and also the whole deal with uh, acid rain, then they stopped using aerosol cans. Like you couldn't use hairspray. You couldn't use deodorant. You had to use roll-on deodorants because that was playing into the acid rain and it was also playing into the giant hole in the ozone layer. So in addition, we went from sun tanning lotion to sunscreen. You had to have sunscreen to protect you from the ultraviolet rays that were coming in through this giant hole in the ozone layer. So that, again, was another scare technique where the entire American population went out and stopped using suntan lotion, stopped using aerosol, <clears throat> started using sunscreen to protect their skin against the harmful rays of the sun due to this giant hole in the ozone layer. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a terrible cold today. Oh. But anyway, so, you know, we're talking the next ice age. We're talking about acid rain. We're talking about the giant hole in the ozone layer. So once we were conditioned with that, that's when we moved into global warming. So I still remember Al Gore, the global warming uh, guru, who I believe has a 15,000 square foot home was the one that started lecturing us, talking about all of us cutting down on our carbon footprint and being more responsible when it came to the environment. Then I still will never forget his movie, An Inconvenient Truth, where he came out and lectured society on the effects of global warming. It had to do with the auto emissions, emissions from factories and things like that, in which we were polluting the uh, atmosphere. So global warming, I still love the video, you know, Inconven Inconvenient Truth, they show him riding around in his private jet, lecturing us on our carbon footprints. To me, that, to me, it still makes me laugh to think about this arrogant politician flying around the world, jet setting around in his private jet to attend <laughs> global warming summits to lecture us on our use of gasoline, our use of other fossil fuels. It was laughable. It was truly laughable, but the American people bought it. So, global warming became a, became a very polarizing topic. And then, for whatever reason, there was a need to switch the narrative again. So we went from, once again, the next ice age. We went to acid rain. We went to the giant hole in the ozone layer that apparently has repaired itself because we don't hear about that anymore. And my question always was, if we were sending the emissions from fossil fuels into the atmosphere and there was a giant hole in the ozone layer, why were greenhouse gases being trapped into the environment? Wouldn't they just escape into space through the giant hole in the ozone layer? So that was never explained to me. And maybe I'm just not bright enough to understand the concept. I'm sure there are some scientists out there that would love to lecture me and educate me on the many ways in which I don't understand this whole climate emergency that we're living in. So 
we were, you know, again in the global warming arena. Then, for whatever reason, we switched to climate change. That's what we are still following today. And if you really think about the beauty of the term climate change, <laughs> it's amazing because you can't prove it wrong. I mean, we all know that the climate changes. The climate constantly changes. There are ebbs and flows, ups and downs in temperatures over the history of our planet. And this is something that's always going to happen. So now we are promoting climate change. And I love the fact that there is at least $100 billion a year tied to this annually. $100 billion a year. So where is this money going? Is this money going to windmills that are now proving to be ineffective? They freeze in cold, in te cold temperatures. They kill wildlife that fly into them. The parts are all lubricated with fossil fuels. And they literally, some of these giant windmills have been malfunctioning and giant pieces have been falling off and landing on the ground in areas where these windmills are. So windmills, how much money went into those? How much money, again, is being wasted on the windmill technology? Now let's talk about electric cars. Now don't get me wrong. I hate paying for gas. I'm not someone that loves to go, pay, go and pay Joe Biden's inflated gas prices somewhere in the vicinity of $4 a gallon in the Northeast. So that's not what I'm into. So again, if I could get an electric car that ran and I could save money on gas, all good. And again, I, I have nothing against a healthier planet by preventing emissions from being sent into the air and possibly polluting us. Again, fine. But if you look at the electric cars, Number one, what goes into producing an electric car battery? Has anyone Googled it? I'm not going to explain this because I really can't explain it. Uh, but if you go and Google what goes into mining the lithium that goes into electric batteries, it's literally strip mining. They have young children strip mining large areas of land to develop the lithium that needs to go into these electric batteries. So I'm not sure how that's earth friendly, but... They continue to say that it is. Now, with the electric batteries as well, if you have all these electric vehicles on the road, what's going to happen to the batteries when they're no longer useful? Will they be put in a landfill? Some of the parts are able to be recycled, but still a large majority of the parts that go into these batteries are not able to be recycled. So these are going to end up in landfills. Again, not sure how that's earth-friendly. Now, have you thought about the charges? For electric cars, where does the power come from that powers the electrical grid that charges electric vehicles? Fossil fuels. So again, we're being told windmills, drive electric cars. How about solar panels on houses? Now, I would love to have solar panels on my house. This past month, my electric bill was $700. We have a family of six. We have a you know, good-sized house. And we use, I think, the typical amount of elect electricity, but we pay in, in big months seven, eight hundred bucks for our electricity. I would love to get away from paying that amount of money. So I talked to a friend recently who had solar panels installed on his house. $75,000 to purchase and put solar panels on your house. So you're looking at eight to 10 years before you even make your money back on solar panels. And what happens when new technology comes out? Where are the old solar panels going to go? Again, some of these can be recycled. Others are going to end up in landfills. So solar panels, windmills, electric vehicles, are they all really better for the environment? Or are we just looking to transition away from the fossil fuel companies? And is this a power grab by the companies that are now selling supposedly environmentally friendly products? So I don't know. There's a lot out there. I'm someone that I want to live on a healthy planet. I'm like any other person out there. The liberals push this. I'm far from being a liberal, but I don't want to live on a dirty, polluted planet. And if we had ways to eliminate emissions from the world, wonderful, wonderful. I think it's a great thing for all of us. But what I have a problem with is that these powers that be, the World Economic Forum, Soros, whoever's pushing these climate change agendas, 
I don't believe they have the best interest of the world and the people at heart. It's about power. It's about money. That's where it all comes into play. So to recap, you know, what we talked about back in the 70s, there was the next ice age. It was on Time Magazine's cover. Then acid rain, right? Acid rain. The giant hole in the ozone layer that's apparently repaired itself. Because that was a huge issue back in the 80s going into the 90s, right? Then it was global warming with Al Gore flying around in his private jet lecturing us on our carbon footprints. Now we've transitioned to climate change. So it doesn't matter if it's hot, if it's cold, if it's raining, if it's dry, it don't, if there are earthquakes, it doesn't matter what happens. It's all because of climate change and the money keeps flowing in. So people, I guess my point of this is you could be on the left, you could be on the right, you can believe whatever you believe. And I think that you need to understand that you cannot believe everything that is force-fed to you in the media, by the politicians, by any of these powers that be, because they all have special interests behind it. Do we all want a healthier planet? Of course we do. Do I believe in these narratives that are constantly thrown at us and they keep shifting every few years? I don't believe them. I really don't believe them. So anyway, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. I hope all of you have a wonderful Wednesday, a wonderful week. We're halfway to the weekend, thank goodness. And just get out there and live your life. And you know, if you can, turn off the TV, put down the phone, because it's not healthy for all of us to be consistently consumed with this propaganda daily. And I feel it. I'm sure we all feel it. So I guess my podcast could be considered more of the same. But after you're done listening to my podcast, put down your phone and walk away. All right. So everyone, I hope you have a wonderful week. I love all of you. As I've said on every podcast, I appreciate every single one of you that tunes in and listens to me. Hopefully you find some value in the messages that I send out to you. And if you could, please tell a friend, please share my podcast with someone you think might be interested. I'm not doing this for the money. I make literally nothing off this podcast. I'm doing it to get the message out there and hopefully to make us think. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. God bless you. And thank you very much for tuning into the John DeVito Show. I appreciate it more than you can imagine. Have a great day.